engineering. His expertise is in um, working on all the kind of digital information, the growing impact of digital information, and he does a lot of writing on the intersection of digital technology with public policy and the law. Next to him, we've got Mike Takahashi, who's the Associate Director of Digital at UCLA Marketing and Special Events. His specialty is in digital strategy and marketing across web, mobile, and social media. And then we've got our own, Seth Sicilian, VP of Academic Affairs. He's a dual degree major from USC in chemical engineering and econ. He's done work with GE, um, sorry, in electrical distribution industry and on green technology products. At Anderson, he focuses on entrepreneurship and healthcare. So, glad to have everyone here. It's a great panel. Let's come on. So, the first question I want to throw to the panel to start off the discussion is, Mary Lou recently joined Google X, and I think there's been a lot of buzz in media around Google Glass and what it's going to do. And what I really want to throw to you is, what's going to be the future of mobile technology? How are entertainment and business going to blur, and how are we going to start interacting with our devices in different ways? Start off with Seb and just right. go down the panel. All right, sure. Um, so with Google Glass, it seems like the technology is still not uh, going to work. Very interesting technology you can see while you're working. It obviously takes away the, the need for looking at your phone or the need for looking anything up. Everything's in front of you while you're interacting with everybody else. So from that perspective, and uh, as you see the innovations we have, it seems like our daily interaction, whether it's in business or interpersonal, are highly fused with either social media or some kind of technology. So when you bring in the Google Glass and you take away some of the negative aspects of holding your phone while you're looking at, uh, while you're talking to people, you bring in this new aspect of, well, can you only interact with one person at a time, or are we gonna have a need of interacting or doing one thing while we have a ton of other things happening on our right side? So, uh, to answer the question, I'm not sure, but uh, I can see some zeros gonna happen. Yeah, I think it's, it's pretty interesting. I don't know if you guys have seen the video that Google released of the person who has glasses and they're walking around, say downtown, they go to subways, they get the weather, they get when the train's coming, they get email from friends who says, hey, what time are you coming? So a lot of it, what Seth was talking about too, is personalization. And what will enable personalization is obviously social. So when we think about things from a digital marketing standpoint, let's take, for example, brands. So if you're walking down the street and there's a Starbucks, you would A, know that maybe you don't like Starbucks, and that you like coffee beans. So it wouldn't be being offered for a discount on a coffee or something like that. Or let's say you're walking past a restaurant and one of your friends really loves this restaurant and wants you to try it. A, a message could pop up on Google Glasses that says, hey, John says that you should try this restaurant. It's his favorite and he really loves this type of meal. So there's some things with personalization and social that I think will be really important with glass, Google Glasses in that aspect. And I'll just add to that and more of the question you posed is where are we going with mobile technology? And I think the next few years are gonna see essentially almost the final step with the bandwidth problems going away. If you look at how much bandwidth we have today, it's dramatically better than where it was five or ten years ago on, on wireless devices. But it's still not there. Right? You still can't, no, nobody in this room has a smartphone with an HD screen and can stream you know, HD movies anywhere you know, if you're a passenger in a car or driving down the freeway. It's just our, our infrastructure and our devices aren't there. So we'll see the closing of that gap where we can essentially have essentially infinite access to media bandwidth pretty much where, wherever we go. The other thing I'd add is that um, it's one thing to be able to deliver essentially unlimited amounts of information to us. It's another thing to do so in a way that enhances our interaction with that information as opposed to confusing us. And uh, you know, we've all heard sort of the cocktail party effect where it's difficult to, you know, you can focus on one conversation, separating it out from the background noise, but you really can't follow two independent conversations, and certainly at least I can't follow five or six. And so the fact that we are able to present to us, you know, 50 different things at the same time in our field of view doesn't necessarily So with all the information that is fragmented, and like you're saying, we're going to have kind of unlimited access to information, how do you think about organizing it kind of from the back end? I know you, you've done a lot of work and research on it. Like, what are your thoughts? Yeah, and this is a, a well-known problem, like you know, the, the big data problem is part of this, right? We have, you know, the problem is now acquiring the data, the problem is sorting it and managing it. There's a whole host of solutions uh, from very, very technical solutions to simple visual presentation solutions, which can mean a lot. And I think folks at places like Google are very, very well aware of that. How do you augment? Have you, have you pulled from the, the infinite database of information about what might be in somebody's field of view and selected and present that? It's really intellectually revealing to us. So to that end, Mike, 
let's talk about visual information and kind of how people have changed how to print information. You see a lot of these new media companies coming out there that specifically focus on taking a lot of data and making infographics or really easy to use, kind of easy to understand data versus in some kind of visual sense. So have you seen any trends in terms of how people are now consuming data or understanding Oh, oh definitely. Um, a lot of what you guys will most likely hear is something called the second screen. So what you've seen is something like the Super Bowl. Uh, a lot of people were asking, well, who, who won the Super Bowl? Who was the biggest brand that won? Was it Pepsi? Was it Starbucks or whatever brand? And the winner clearly was Twitter. If you saw a lot of the commercials, a lot of them had a hashtag. I don't know if you guys noticed that. And, and that was a big win for Twitter because a lot of people are interacting with brands now on their cell phones. So they see a commercial, they'll use the hashtag, and they'll tweet about it, they'll talk to their friends about it, they'll watch a TV show, they'll give it an immediate response, which is, which is golden, right? Because before then, if you think about it, for, for marketing, when you're watching a television show or you're doing something like that, the only feedback you could really get was, let's say we did a, a poll or you know, we did some research after the fact. And now brands are able to get this data in real time. And that is something that hasn't happened before. So with things like the Super Bowl, uh, when something like the blackout happened, right? A brand that really took advantage of that was Oreo. And they, they tweeted a, a photo that I can't remember exactly what it was, but they, they played on the fact that there was a blackout. And people really put that in and started tweeting about this Oreo ad that, that had made a uh, compliment to what happened in the blackout. Or we look at the Oscars, for example, and how people are tweeting about who's the best dressed. And people are just talking uh, and engaging in real time. So I think that's a powerful way that people are, are processing information using their second screen. Okay, and so kind of as a student, somebody who's working, who's doing all these different things, how do you feel about all the information that's available to you and kind of make sense of the world. I think uh, for us, it's, a, it's too much information most of the time. Uh, <clears throat> if you look around now, students are busy sometimes just in the media. Uh, they want everything aggregated, but then there's all too much information that's being aggregated. I think from the uh, data delivery side, uh, technology is there to collect everything. Uh, I don't think we have a good understanding of what people want to see. Uh, probably with social media and a lot of the other kind of data analytics that happens in the back end, it's going to be personalized, and once that's personalized, it's going to be easier for each individual. Uh, but I don't think we're at that point now. Yeah, I mean, if I could just speak a little bit more about the big data and, and what we'll see with all this data and social, we'll see patterns evolve. So if we look at it at a very granular level, everybody's familiar with the site called Yelp and its reviews. So if you go to a restaurant now, they have a little section called Review Highlights. And in it, it picks keywords that people are constantly talking about. So let's say that the pasta is amazing at this restaurant. It'll say 55 people have said that the pasta is great. And how is it doing that? It's getting all this data and it's finding the patterns and it's saying, okay, well, this is what we know that 50 people all agree is great in the pasta. And so that's just one small portion of how this big data is coming into play. Okay. So Mary Lou kind of quickly talked about government regulation potentially with all these different things that are going on. And privacy and security has been something that's been talked about a lot in the media, but then at the same time, you see a lot of users who are willingly giving up their information, that people aren't maybe as private about it as you think. I think, John, you know, what do you think about government's role in trying to regulate and monitor a lot of this versus private companies? Well, I, I, the first thing, I, I would say that it is true that people uh, are, we have far less privacy than we had in the past. I don't know that people would, I think people are giving up far more privacy than they recognize. And the fact that we have all this information out there that's collected from us, I don't think should be construed as mean necessarily that we would be comfortable if we knew the amount of information that was being traded, for example, sold to third parties and aggregated from our mobile devices and so on. Uh, so I, privacy is a huge issue. Um, it is, you know, when I see the, the possibility of technically, you know, basically doing a, 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 a screenshot of your brain, right, to say everything you're possibly thinking, you know, some people might think, hey, what an efficient way to output in my brain, but I think, well, gosh, you know, if I'm sitting here thinking, well, you know, it was nice of my friend to invite me over to dinner last night, but the food he served was really terrible. I mean, do I want that sort of, you know, extracted from my mind? And, you know, it, it runs up against, we have very, very strong <coughs> constitutional protections against, you know, what are called the, con the, bound the contents of your mind. And that's always been behind a wall provided by the Fifth Amendment. And the, the, the possibility that we can reach behind that wall, um, despite not affirmatively agreeing to that, that's, that's something that's, that's somewhat concerning. Privacy. Uh, one of the cool things, uh, well, not cool things, but if you've seen her other talks, she in the previous talk she mentioned one way this could be used is probably in the criminal 
uh, field where you can have weaknesses verify or have better accuracy of data. I find it interesting that she didn't mention it at all this time. There's definitely going to be fears of how this information is going to be used. Uh, but at the same time, uh, most of us probably don't have our Facebook uh, privacy settings as tight as they should be. And people will be willingly giving away because they don't know what the implications are. They're, they're not full of the information. So if I can just respond, I, I think that the difference between what we put on Facebook, which you affirmatively, and if you go on Facebook or you tweet, hey, I just had a great burrito at XYZ, you've at least consciously made a decision to present that information to the world. Whereas if you're, if you're consenting to having your brain extracted or mapped, then you, know, you might find that you have parted with information that you thought was you know, private. So I think there's a, there's a difference, an important difference there. Well, well, a little bit of a difference, but also we give our information on medical, uh, you know, medical records or somewhere, if someone has access to them. Uh, same way for seeing a psychiatrist or a lawyer. We share a lot of information we feel has some kind of security around it. There might be an opportunity that this may be the same way, but it's still down to the same privacy concerns that you mentioned. Right. No, I mean, I, I just think that's a great point. John was saying that it's also the stuff that you don't want people to know and that maybe you didn't think was there and then they would have do this scan and then all of a sudden you would see it and think, oh my gosh, there's all these things that I don't want anybody to know. And then they found And the other, the other question, concern I have is this, you know, this would be interpreted by quote experts, right? So they do a scan of someone's brain and say, he's clearly contemplating robbing a bank next week. And, you know, maybe he was, maybe <laughs> he wasn't, right? But there'd be some expert who testified that, you know, he or she has seen a zillion of these and that's what this person is thinking. That, that, you know, again, we have seen how, quote, experts, you know, analyzing, you know, purported intent in other contexts, you know, lie detector tests is a classic example where it's very, very complicated. Uh, and, you know, the, the idea of criminal you know, stuff, I mean, even that's complicated, right? Because there are, there are people who are pathological who can say, you know, I'm 150 feet tall, and we really believe it, right? And so if you, you know, if you scan their brain, maybe you say, hey, you're telling the truth, you're 150 feet tall. So one thing that I thought was interesting is when Mary was talking about the idea of brain scans and all this stuff, she's talking about how you're going to be super social, you're going to share everything. But my immediate reaction to when she was talking about it was almost like you'd be in your head more. And this is something that Mike and I were talking about before the panel started, which is through all this technology, you have a lot more means of communication, but you can also be more isolated in a way. And you know, human social interaction is decreasing, but we're increasing our technological interaction. And kind of how are we going to move as a human beings, because we're naturally social, but how is, what is that going to look like in the next 20, 30, 40 years? Um, so I, I took the talk a little differently. For me it was, I didn't get the social aspect a lot, but for me it was if you're thinking it and your computer can draw it for you, you kind of get away from trying to explain or trying to do it yourself. Same way if you're trying to, I'm trying to explain the scenery for Mike, instead of trying to find the words, I could just think it and then an image would be there for him to see. Uh, I guess that was, probably the social interaction that could happen, probably a lot of other things. Um, but uh, otherwise, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure how social will play into it. Mike, right. any thoughts in terms of marketing and like, you know, all these different mediums that we have to interact with things? Well, I, I definitely think that, I mean, we had this conversation earlier too, it's just, it's really amazing how now when, when you go somewhere and you see families around the dinner table at a restaurant and everybody is just, they're on their phone and they're not paying attention to the people or walk into a subway station or an airport and everybody is just walking around with their phones and so it's it's that implication of that social being okay it's, it's not a one-to-one -one anymore in, in the physical sense it's more all digital so uh, you know that, that's interesting to me and just seeing how that's evolved and I think there's actually a good case for the inverse uh, conclusion which is that some things don't change if you look at this event right here um, we're doing this in a forum which we could have done 50 or 100 or 150 years ago We'll be asking questions. We have four, four people up here talking, just using regular language, no brain scans, or anything else. And I think that's an extremely efficient way to have an interchange about this. Uh, so, uh, you know, we're not up here texting stuff and putting fancy things on screens and all that. I think that, that says something, too, about what hasn't changed. So that's interesting. You deal with information in a lot of different ways. What do you think is the most like efficient way to communicate? Well, I think, you know, it's interesting. What it, I think it, you, it, you, to answer that question, you have to talk about visual communication separately from audio communication. Um, off from in terms of audio, we have evolved over an extremely long time to speak. To speak, And I've actually done work quantifying the amount of information in human natural language. Uh, and uh, I think it's a very efficient way to communicate. And, you know, I don't think, for example, anyone could come up with some sort of 
fast audio stream and put on some fast headphones and hear in 10 seconds what would normally take us an hour to hear. I think that we, we have, our brains have a certain capacity. I think there is an opportunity to be much more um, efficient with how we do visual presentation. If you look at what today's screens can do versus what the screens of 30 years ago could do, it would be dramatically more efficient. So that, you know, the amount of, in, put it this way, the amount of information that you have in your visual field, if you look around and you say, how many bits per second of information are you able to take in? It's a truly stunning number that goes way beyond our current bandwidths from which our systems are currently so That's an area we could have a lot of improvement. Any other thoughts on that? Okay, why don't we um, move the discussion a little bit? So, we talked about this kind of on our email chain before we got here that what is going to be the thing that fuels the next kind of generation of growth in technology? And my argument was that I think it's been software in the past like 20 years. And to be fair, I studied electrical engineering, but I think what happens is when you get here to California, you get to be near the Bay Area, everyone talks about software. They talk about software engineers are the engineers that people talk about. You think about a CTO, you think about making your own app and making a lot of money. So I'm gonna start with Zeb, because you also studied a different kind of engineering. What is the perception of you know the other kinds of engineering? And how do we recruit students to help in all these other things which really facilitate software, right? So I know John will talk about it. Um, so I have, a, I have a dual view that I think they, uh, maybe in the early 2000s, the uh, computing power went up significantly, uh, and then the software was lagging, and then we kind of caught up by late 2000. But if you look around now, uh, most of the technology around us is enabled by actually hardware. Um, from the most ba basic thing, we talk a lot about cloud computing now, mostly driven by really very intense servers, and then hardware that actually can transmit that data to you through 4G or very advanced Wi-Fi. And then you look at how we interact, you look at the iPad, you look at your phones, you actually do have HD screens on little phones now. Um, and that enabled the software uh, to kind of meet what the capabilities or the needs uh, are out there for people who have them. So I don't, I don't see it as it's been just software, I think they both <coughs> enable one another. Um, hardware on one end allows the software to be built and then the other software, uh, the SAS uh, type soft service as software, software as a service, uh, uh, kind of businesses, so I wouldn't put one over the other. Uh, but with that being said, now that the hardware is kind of caught up, uh, if you look at your computers, we're no longer trying to get to 10, 10 gigahertz of speed, we're trying to get to two with four cores just to make it more efficient. Uh, there is a big need for, for software. Uh, there's a big need kind of from big data to analyze the software, kind of from uh, the perspective on how we interact with these devices, that's gonna require software. And just two days ago, there was a big campaign that was launched by Code.org on trying to even get software coding into high school uh, groups by, um, and they had to see a lot of people uh, to do that talk, a very big campaign. So there's, that's gonna be the way I feel. It's gonna have to start early. Um, I did a little bit of computer programming in, in, in undergrad. It was a requirement. Um, it didn't feel like it needed something that you need to be in college to do. Uh, it's something, it was just like a language that you could learn. Um, probably as we're moving forward with the education here, you're just going to start seeing it earlier and earlier in education, and it's just going to be another way of, of talking. Yeah, I mean, to that end, uh, Mayor Bloomberg of New York City has just introduced a pilot program where they're going to have co coding into 30 high schools. And But that, then again, that's the thing, right? The focus is always on coding. It's not on some of these other types of technologies. John, I don't know. Well, yeah, I, I just, you know, uh, when I, um, so I sent a, a friendly response to, to uh, Abby earlier that, that I think software is really important, but all of that is really enabled by hardware. And it's actually really interesting here at UCLA, um, some of the most fundamental work that has led to this, this incredible growth in electronics devices uh, actually occurred right here at UCLA. And if you look at the last 20 years of, of, of these devices that have changed how we, how we engage with the world, we have desktop personal computers, the laptops, the first cell phones, today's smartphones, tablets, these high-speed networks, the servers that are running the plumbing, you know, when you do a Google search, it's going searching through these servers that have all these processors in them. And so those technology advances have been fundamental to enabling all of this functionality that we consider, many of us consider software enabled functionality. So it's really, you know, as Deb was saying, it's, it's really good. And, and I know I said a gentle, gentle pushback I'd offer is I don't think we've seen the end of the road with the hardware. I think it's always easy to look back and say, gosh, we've come so far, you know, it's sort of hard to imagine going farther. But, but imagine a world where processors are 100 or 1,000 or 10,000 times more efficient than they are today and smaller than they are today. It's hard to imagine, but no harder really or no more surprising than the world we live in today would have been somewhere in 1960 or 1970. And it's hard for us, just like 
know, very smart person in 1980, you would have really been hard pressed to predict social networks or something. This really would have been hard. Um, I think it's hard for us today to, to say, you know, what we, how we know or what will make it possible in 2030, for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think what, it, what it's amazing to see is just what you have in your hand here is an amazing computer. And we're seeing so much of everything in your everyday lives now being held in this. It's being used as a phone. It's being used as your planner. It's being used for everything in daily life. It's almost like you need this as a task to have every day when you wake up. Whereas, you know, when you left 10 or 20 years ago, it was completely different. But now we have this dependency, a lot of people on this phone, and it does so many things for us. And okay, I'm gonna throw this question to Mike. So one of the things we have going on right now with business and technology kind of, the role of marketing is changing a lot. You know, I think previously marketing was thought to be much more based on like psychology, appealing to people. Not that that isn't true anymore, but now like you're saying there's a lot more big data on the back end. What are your different CRM tools? How are you reaching your customers? And it's become a lot more quantitative. What are the things going forward that you think next, the next generation of marketers are gonna need as tools to be successful in the talking to a business school audience? Well, I think if we talk about tools, it's, I think, that going back to big data, that's going to be important, and just also uh, personalization. So really, what we're seeing, for example, with Facebook, and we're, they're seeing a lot of growth, is with something called sponsored stories. So if you guys use Facebook, you'll see you know, ads that come in your newsfeed, but they're tailored towards you. So for example, they know certain aspects about what you like, your dislikes, and they're now focusing content targeted specifically to you, which as before, if you had a magazine or you, there was a billboard, you could kind of figure out your audience, right? If you had a magazine and it was a business magazine, you knew who the, your audience was because you had subscribers. But with all this data and personalization, you can really figure out who that person is. And then you can tailor a lot of the marketing to that person specifically. So I think that's huge and that is happening right now. So one of the things that we like discussed in e-com last quarter was some of these companies get exposed for doing some of the personalization. So, you know, I think it was like Travelocity or Expedia, they showed more expensive hotel rooms to iPad or like Mac users. And like people got to know that and then people got angry. So on the one hand, you're gonna have personalization, but on the other hand, because information is so easily available, people can say, hey, well, I got $5 off at Starbucks. No, I got $10 off, things like that. How do you keep that separate or how do you provide a consistent brand message when you're reaching, trying to reach different people with different price sensitivities, you know, different things like that? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. Um, you know, I think at the core is just is transparency. E even with the, the, the problem you're saying with the computers and things like that, I, I remember a little bit about that, but I don't remember if they were open about what they were doing. Okay, so. If they got exposed by, it was like, either, I think Bloomberg or Economist or someone yeah. like discovered that they were doing this. But I mean, that's always gonna be a problem of, of targeting different audiences and giving people this deal versus that deal. So I don't think that would per se ever go away, but it's something that we're just gonna have to continue to confront. In situations, for example, where say you're buying a shirt and based on your preferences, you, there's an online search score, it gives you the more expensive item, but it's because it's something that you're more related to. Um, wouldn't there be an opportunity there for companies and, uh, that are doing yeah, this? Yeah, yeah, it goes, goes back to personalization. So right. essentially, you know, finding out uh, the things that you like or, or the things that perhaps your friends like or, or that are or influential to you. And, and those things that will be personalized to you will help influence your buying habits. Okay, so I'm going to take it back. I'm going to ask one last question, and then we'll open it up to the audience. Kind of at the beginning, when Mary was talking about experimenting with all these different doses and trying to figure out who she is, she talked kind of about how she was like a live experiment, and she was doing these different things to figure out what was going to be the best her. So I know you've all done different kinds of experiments and different kind of innovations. So starting with John, can you just talk to us a little about, a bit about what is your process for innovation? Like, what are the things you look for, and how are you pushing yourself? Yeah, well, so I certainly can't uh, comment on doses, tuning doses to make the best me. I've never, never tried that. Um, but, but I think uh, for me, uh, I think it's really important to look way outside kind of your own vertical world. And to me, it's the most, the most inspirational, the, the, the most power I get when I'm trying to do something innovative is to, is to look at seemingly unrelated domains and finding potential correlations that may or may not be there, uh, as opposed to sort of you know, looking in, in your own vertical. I think for me, that works. Whether that's the right formula for everyone is a different question, but for me, that's very important. So there's almost always something to learn. Uh, and uh, when you learn about these seemingly disparate things, you know, even if 9% of it doesn't directly apply to your own work, there's that 10% that does that really gives you uh, that sense, an edge.
things that you wouldn't have had had you just stayed with what you already know. So yeah, I would definitely agree, you know, it's just thinking outside the box and really trying to tackle something that is, you're not just constantly looking at the same thing, you're, you're looking at what other people are doing, what has been said, it's not specifically in that one area, it's maybe in other industries or other things to give you ideas of what maybe someone else hasn't thought of yet. Um, a really good book is, is by uh, Clayton Christensen, it's called Innovator's Dilemma. If you guys haven't read that, I would definitely recommend checking this book out. It's about disruptive technologies and how he studied how a lot of market leaders were just, they were so in tune with what they were doing that these small little players came in and built disruptive technologies that took the marketplace of, of these established companies. And it's something if you're really into innovation, I'd recommend reading. Uh, yeah, one thing we learned here is attachment to something you have. So uh, the idea with experimenting is, and something that we used to do a lot in undergrad when I was came here is, you do great experiments, you forget about it, and you do the next one, and it doesn't work. I think as you're moving forward, you start investing more time in your experiments, and it becomes harder to let go of the experiment when it's not going your way. So definitely having people around you, uh, and I know this, uh, worked at a startup uh, in Pasadena that does devices, and they go through a lot of iterations on, on their device, and you need to have someone there that is the guy that is the hardcore, the economic view that it's a loss, it's a sunk cost, move on, let's try something new. So that having someone like that in the team can really help move forward. Can I just give one example though? This is just give you an example of how this could be like, what does it mean looking outside of the net? One example is in, in, in here, and one of the things we worry about a lot is communication. So how can we use bits, ones and zeros, to most efficiently convey information from one point to another? And so one of the things I've been doing is not looking at bits, but looking at human language. How do we use speech to convey information from one person to another? Because that system, as it were, has been optimized for far longer than any electronic system we have here. And it turns out there are things that you can learn from that domain about how you optimize the communication system. That's just a concrete example. Very cool. Okay, I'd like to open it up to questions. Do we have any? Um, we've got one over here. The mic will be coming very shortly to you. <laughs> Great. Yeah, I'll um, thank you for coming. Uh, Sam earlier mentioned so how we're getting bombarded by, by information these days. It's everywhere. Uh, products like Google Glass, in a way, is sort of in perpetuate that because you're walking around, you're getting information about Starbucks, restaurants. How do you think restaurants, sorry, not restaurants, companies like Google will balance the need for innovation at the same time, not bombarding people with information all the time? I think one of the things could be choices and, and and if we go really technical settings, so for example, if you use glasses, it's, it's, it's up to the user how they want their content delivered to them yeah. and, and how they choose to interact with Google Glasses. So specifically, let's say you want a specific thing to you only when you use glasses. You don't want any ads. You don't want any offers and things like that. That's gonna be important and that should be within the world. I think he brings up a good point. Do you think this is the case of technology for the sake of technology? Like, is there really a business or use case for this? Or this is so cool and now people are gonna figure out how to use it? What do you guys think? So, I mentioned it earlier. I think it's a cool technology. I don't think they know what to do with it yet. Uh, and I, if it were, because it's, it's been working, it seems. It has for over a year. It's, we see it commercialized already. Uh, but not everything, I mean, it's, it's science and innovation. If you only follow the market, you'd, you'd lose on a lot of things. And uh, there might be other different uses. I mean, uh, if you're in the military, I can see this being very, very effective when you're having that kind of very targeted communication or if you're using this as part of a team or coordination setting, uh, those applications start becoming uh, very, very effective in having this secondary data streaming right in front of you. We, I think we have a question over here. Uh, I don't know if I, a question is actually appropriate, but you can answer it. I'm wondering in the next 10, 20, 30 years, what are going to be the most important advances in whatever you guys do, uh, if you're going to learn to help the world or move us on to a better age in the 20th century? Uh, so uh, there was a talk yesterday about innovation and how uh, the last century was pretty much the best we were going to have in terms of leaps and bounds on innovation. And the next upcoming century is just going to be incremental. Uh, the panel seems to very much disagree with that. Uh, but if we look at the biggest issues we have today, it's like increased population, uh, more urban cities, uh, excessive use of resources because everybody's coming to one place, it's, it's probably gonna kind of start with, with power. Uh, it's, it's changed the way we do things over the last century and it's gonna be needed to change things in the future. So if, if we can come up with a way where we can deliver the power easier, cheaper, uh, definitely cleaner, I think that's gonna be the biggest thing uh, to move forward with. 
I guess I'll just add to that that um, when we're just talking about technology, we can certainly take this approach, hey, we're doing pretty well right now, but, but one of the most powerful um, examples of technology where technology can be part of the solution, it's certainly not the whole solution, is just lifting people globally out of poverty. Uh, and if you look, for example, uh, we still have obviously an enormous problem there, an enormous amount of progress that we can and should be focusing on. One very specific example is mobile phones. If you look at mobile phones now, the penetration rate of mobile phones globally is, is truly incredible. So this is, a, this is an example of a technology that has, has benefited really you know, a huge fraction of the adults on the entire planet. And I think if you look at what can happen in the next couple of decades, I think what we should aspire to is not to get, frankly, twice the bandwidth on our wireless systems that we have now, but to have a world where we, we in these you know, developing economies can bring hundreds and hundreds of millions or billions of people out of poverty so one of the things that Mary Lou Jepson didn't talk about today, but has talked about previously, is how she was able to reduce the power consumption of displays to make one laptop per child really out of $100. And what she talked about was going to China, basically spending about two years there working with the manufacturers to come up with a new system where they could reduce the power display because they had this global nonprofit push. And so my question to you is, you're right. We all use a ton of power. It's in all the devices we use every day. Who should be investing in it? Should, we, should it be companies? Should it be the government because it is a global solution? Like, you know, it's a global problem. There's environmental effects always, obviously, with all these things. Where is that innovation coming from and where should it come from? Um, I guess I'll start. Uh, I think it will come from everybody. Uh, saying that it's the responsibility of private companies over uh, the government or government over nonprofit. Yeah, I think each one of them fills a different need. Uh, the, the one laptop per child is definitely one more on the nonprofit side, but uh, when you look at its backers, it's probably backed by people that are in the profit world. Uh, it's just not part of their core competencies or what they do best. Uh, governments uh, will push new technology. Uh, the newest thing now we see is finally a little bit more of electric cars on the road. Uh, I work for GE. This initiative was started in 2009, and we're barely seeing cars on the road today, mostly because one, battery technology wasn't there, no one was trying to invest in it, and two, we didn't have the infrastructure to deliver that power. Someone had to pay for that, and someone had to pay for it for other people to do it, so it's kind of a catch-22 thing. In those situations, I feel that's where the government interference is best. Uh, I'm, I'm sure there'll be examples that can prove me wrong, but, uh, and then on the other side, where, where you're dealing with uh, big issues like uh, poverty, uh, it's gonna have to come from both government, public, uh, as well as nonprofit. I guess I'll just sort of take the power consumption problem. You could do it, but you can slice it a bunch of different ways. In terms of, of for our devices, power matters because it's battery life. Sure. Right? So that's the that's the fundamental impact most of us see. In terms of sort of the global energy consumption issue, I don't know that mobile devices really are the tall tale of the tent. Uh, I think there's a lot of other 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 things that we would we could focus on. We should be focusing on rather than getting a display on my smartphone to be 50 percent more efficient. Not that that isn't a good thing, but but that itself, even if you made all the displays in the world consume zero power tomorrow, you still have an enormous energy problem. In the world. So is that battery technology, or what, what do you well, think? Well, certainly more efficient batteries will help, uh, and of course that's been a very difficult problem for yeah. decades, right? And that's, that's, you know, if you look at the rate of progress in integrated circuits, it's incredible. If you look at the rate of progress in battery technology, it's a lot less impressive. It's not that the people aren't smart, it's just a really tr intractable problem. So yeah, for, for lifetime of devices, it's clearly battery technology, efficient processors, efficient displays, absolutely vital. Um, but that doesn't solve you know, the global power problem. You want to look at that, look at the freeways of LA, look at, um, you know, look at you know, heating a 6,000 square foot house on the East Coast in January, there's a lot of, a lot of places that using a lot of power. Uh, uh, yeah, if I can add to that, uh, yeah, so it won't solve energy, but one thing it will do is help that access that you spoke about with the penetration of devices. Absolutely. And I think that's where the, uh, uh, if you look at the one laptop for child, it wasn't the fact that it was cheap or it was going to consume less energy. It was the fact that the people they were serving, even if you gave them a three thousand dollar computer, they had no way of charging it. And if they had no way of charging it, they have to rely on the sun. They have to rely on the sun at the time. So that led to some of this uh, advances in the lower display, which was the biggest uh, energy hawk. So uh, one thing, uh, one thing we always look out for is that uh, you have when you have the technology, you have to make sure it fits the ecosystem. In, in which you're trying to get it to use. And for this case, the display was the biggest barrier and that's what they were able to solve. Okay, thank you. And also, the data that supercomputer uh, works great. Is that the top of the line right now? Uh, those two things are- Which one, sorry, I, I A lot better than a workstation or a supercomputer. There are more 
Is that safe for men, aren't there? What are the ones that don't do? Well, I, I think they're, I don't know if I'd call it supercomputer, there, there are uh, cloud-based computing clusters. That's what it's called? Um, that you can, you can have access to, and there are services now, you can buy as much computing power pretty much as, as you want. So uh -huh. most people aren't computer, compute power limited in what they're doing. And you can find, you know, the, the climate change specialists and people like that who might really always be needing most of us are not running out of computing power. Okay, any more questions? I think we've got one over there. Um, I, have a, I have a question for Professor John. You said in the beginning that one of the challenges in mobile technology is the scarcity of bandwidth. Uh, so in the recent past, there has been developments uh, in 3G and then WiMAX and LTE. Uh, do you feel like LTE is the, the, the problem? I mean, holds the promise that they need to be, and uh, and second and second question is related to uh, natural speech engines. Um, one of the challenges is how to design those engines to be robust to accept different accent uh, variations and accents that people use, and also uh, different type of words that they use to get to interact with the electronic devices. Yeah, I mean, those two completely, completely yeah. separate questions. So, so, so sure. I mean, LTE is is real. It's it's for, for those of you who don't know, you know, three G. There's a third generation mobile systems which most of us have, and then, um, you know, you can slice these generations in ever finer, you know, distinctions. But broadly speaking, LTE uh, is the next is widely viewed as the next wide area. I mean, you to distinguish between Wi-Fi, you have a Wi-Fi access point in this room. That's not LTE. If you have a mobile phone in the back of your car, you're talking to a a cell tower or a cell base station, uh, increasingly throughout the world, they're going to have LTE systems. And yeah, there's a big, there's a big bandwidth increase from LTE, from you know, 2G to 3G to LTE. Uh, but even then, it's not, you know, it's not going to be easy for most people to stream, for example, 50 megabits per second wherever they are, even under a, a widely deployed LTE world. I mean, if, if you're the moon, sun, and stars line up, you might get that, but most people aren't going to get that most of the time. So there's still, there's still room to, room to improve. Uh, and then your second question was, uh, what was the second question? Uh, natural speech is it's really interesting because in the old days what people would, would often do is try to come up with algorithms which would basically have a computer emulate how a person would understand and spark and parse speech. But now it's become possible to sort of, at least in some applications, to basically have a, a, a database that stores everything. I mean, you know, everything you could possibly say up to up to within within reason. And so as you get these enormous ability to store huge amounts of information, it becomes easier to store, you know, databases of, of what almost every word that could be said with almost every possible accent that could be said to your question about access, right? And so I think these engines will get, will get uh, much better uh, than they are, and they've gotten a lot better. I mean, they used to be absolutely terrible, and now they're actually not too bad in some cases. So I think, I think well, that's an area we have a lot of, uh, we have some opportunity for improvement. I think we'll see improvement. Any more questions? We've got one over there. I, don't know. I can, I can take a stab. I, I don't know. I don't have any evidence that the amount of money being spent on that research is disproportionate to its value. I just don't know. Um, you know, it, it may be in fact very proportionate. And I can think of many. You know, if you put aside all the all the kind of consumer applications, I can think of many very important reasons why functional mapping of the brain could be important. For example, for stroke victims, right? To help stroke victims rehabilitate, to to look at certain kinds of, of, of you know, brain function. I mean, there's all sorts of very good reasons that it could be helpful to have that. And I think the studies she was citing were just a few studies, uh, and the government's initiative to really map the brain, um, you know, I, I wouldn't presume to judge that as, as an improper use of money. It might be a great use of money. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Okay. Any more questions? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I have a question. Um, 
One, one of the things you talked about, uh, so the way to achieve this imaging of the mind is, is usually through higher resolution. And over the last few years, there's, you said there was a thousand X increase in magnification. And that resolution does lead to better results even for the lead. We use MRIs and we use CAT scans all the time. And the resolution just isn't there. Uh, I mean, she had a disease and brain tumor that lasted five years before they could even detect it. And at that point, she needs to do through all these and take 12 medications a day. So even if there's not a lot of application that you could think of as having your math, your brain image, and then you can know what you're doing or what you're thinking, there still could be a lot of potential help in other areas where we use them now, today, and we just, and we don't have enough resolution to see that. What I think will be interesting too is the inverse of that, of taking information and putting it in someone's brain. So let's say not studying and learning everything from that, that'll be really interesting, or <coughs> implanting memories. Because if you think about it, when you experience something and you remember it, you think back, it's a memory. But how will the brain distinguish between reality or what was implanted? And would you ever be able to tell the difference between, okay, I really did that, or it was just implanted in my mind? I was just thinking about the inverse of that. And, and the other thing I guess I'd add is it can be so difficult to judge the value of your investment in the technology. You take the internet, which I think most people here probably know was first demonstrated here at UCLA. Um, if you had five or six or seven years after that, where it's kind of after that initial demonstration, if you had said, hey, was it worth it? You know, was, was it? Was that government project worthwhile? Then reasonable people might have said, well, not really, because yeah, they sent some messages with this internet thing, and it that hasn't really shown, it doesn't, doesn't happen, right? Of course, now, no reasonable person would, would ever suggest that it was a bad idea for the U.S. government to fund the work that led to the creation of the internet. Uh, so I think it's hard, you know, without the perspective of a very long time to really come to a, to a, a good judgment on this. Okay, I think we'll take one last question in the back. here in public policy and a couple weeks ago I gave a midterm where they used computers and they wrote an essay in the class and they were handed the cup they were given an assignment to write an essay or a policy memo we call it and they wrote it on the computer they were allowed to use Google and all that kind of stuff and to me that's a very good way of using computers for a test. It's not the only way but it, it goes beyond sort of clicking circles in an A B C D multiple choice. Well, well thank you then for being a good professor. <laughs> <laughs> well. Okay I think we're out of time so I'd like to once again thank our panelists.